OK, everyone, we're ready for our next talk called OpenStack for High Performance Workloads. And our presenter is Felipe Reyes. Hello, everyone. So OpenStack for High Performance Workloads. Um, so I'm Felipe. I'm, part, I'm software engineer at Canonical. I, I've been charm OpenStack PDL at the moment, OpenStack contributor for many years by now. I've contributed not just to Charm OpenStack, but some other op upstream OpenStack projects like Nova and Magnum. And the purpose of this presentation is to try to give you the idea that running software in a private cloud doesn't have to be slow. Typically, when you're running programs in a, in a shared environment, you are going to be facing challenges of contention resources, and typically that gives you a bad experience. But OpenStack provides you a bunch of ways so you can mitigate those, and eventually, depending on if you have enough hardware resources, you're going to be having a pretty good experience. So we're going to go through four, four aspects, what is OpenStack and why it matters, some of the components that compose the OpenStack clouds, what high performance uh, characteristics have and what metrics we care about. And we're gonna, not going to go too deep on this. It's, it's a presentation on its own. But we're going to take a quick look at what metrics are relevant here. And finally, what configuration options uh, OpenStack have to, to deal with all these aspects. So what is OpenStack? set of components that provide common services for a cloud infrastructure. That, that sounds pretty vague. And if you, if you take a look to the high overview, this is, this is what you're dealing with. An API, a REST API, so you can get bare metal servers, virtual machines, or in OpenStack terms, they are called instances, and, and containers. You can configure also to get containers. And then you have a shared networking and storage. And there are a bunch of techniques to mitigate all these aspects so you, you don't have to compete for them. Now, if we, if we open this, this ni nice bug that looks pretty simple, you will start getting into these. Like, it can explode very easily, and you start finding a bunch of things, like the message queue that allows to have long-running tasks and, and have things on the back end. Now, this is an incomplete picture. It's part of the installation guide. It has some components that in the case of Charm OpenStack, we don't have like Grove and, and Sahara, but also it's missing some other that are newer and very relevant for, open, for OpenStack clouds like Octavia. Octavia is the, the one that provides you load balancer as a service, and, and it's pretty critical when you're deploying Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. Um, so now, uh, from all this very large picture, we're, we're going to just pick three components. Uh, the ones that are more relevant for what we're dealing with here. Now, Nova. Nova is the one that typically you're going to be interacting with. It's the one you are going to be requesting your, the creation of your instances. It's the one you're going to be uh, interacting with other services on your behalf, because when you are requesting the creation of, of an instance, you're going to have, you're going to need networking, so you can access it, but you're also going to need some storage. And, and Nova is capable of doing all this on your behalf. Um, so it's important to, to mention that Nova itself, itself is not a hypervisor. It's just a control plane. In the back end, it's going to hand off all the specific virtualization to a driver. In, in our case, it's going to be libvirt and KVM. It's, it's the, the one that we use by default, and the one that it has most of the features we we have interest on. Then you have Cinder. Cinder is, ta is taking care of creating the volumes. In our case, we use Ceph by default, but you can use other, other stuff like LVM, NFS. Uh, there are a bunch of drivers, so you can have a specific network, uh, network appliances that you may have already in your data center, so you can take advantage of, advantage of those. <coughs> Uh, in the case of Charm OpenStack, we also have, we have support for pure storage, NFS, and, and some others. So you can take a look at our documentation. But 
Ceph is the, is the good one. Then you have Neutron. Uh, Neutron is the one that is going to provide you all the overlay networking, so you can have your own IP, uh, IP space, you can have your own private network on top of your cloud, and it's going to allow your services to talk to each other, no matter which node they're running on. And, and again, Nova is the one that is going to be creating ports for you, it's going to be attaching those ports to your VMs, and you don't have, you don't have to talk to Neutron directly, but depending on how sophisticated the network topology that you can define, you may want to create your own subnets, your own ports. If you want uh, instances with multiple ports, you, you have to do all of that on your own. Nova is going to give you like, like the typical VM, one, one NIC, one volume to store your root file system, and, and that's it. Um, also with Neutron, you can model the gateways, and, and that way you, you can configure how, how your network is gonna, how your traffic is gonna flow on your network. Uh, so, we have this, this is the control plane, and now we, what we need is uh, to understand what metrics we want to, to monitor, because when we're gonna be optimizing, we're gonna be caring about the specific things. Not everyone cares about everything, it's just about pros and cons. Now, when it comes to something that you want to perform well, depending on who you are asking to, he's gonna be thinking on memory. Someone may be thinking about IOPS, input-output transactions per second. Some people are gonna be thinking about throughput. Some others are gonna be CPU-bound problems, and some others about lat latency in case you have a service that you are expecting to serve those requests under a given threshold, latency is gonna be crucial. All of them, all of these metrics get interrelated. So every time you are pushing uh, to have CPU optimizations, you may be affecting some others. So, so you need to be me measuring those metrics and, and understand how, how they are being uh, managed. Now, this is a, it's a very well-known diagram. Uh, this one is from Brendan Gregg. He's a well-known person having given multiple presentations around performance and observability tools. And this one gives you an idea of, depending on what you want to take a look into in the, in, at the, in the system, what tools you may have available. So if it's an application, if it's sockets, uh, TCP connections, and so on. So, um, I really recommend visiting Brandon Gregg's website. It ha there, there are many presentations. He has a book on, on the topic and all of that. Now, OpenStack configurations. So, um, one of the, the most easy to set up is host aggregates. So, you may have a fleet of nodes and those, those nodes may have different properties. And in, in this case, we are, gonna, we are creating a specific that is uh, for, VM, for, for nodes that have SSDs. So we want to create a flavor, and the flavor is the one that is going to define what characteristics the, the instances you're creating will have. And so you create the, the aggregate, and, and you will be you will be setting a property, in this case, SS, SSD equals true. And after that, you're gonna be start adding all, all the different nodes that have, uh, have this property. This is all on the, on the administrator side, not, not a regular user of an OpenStack cloud is gonna have access to those because it's, this is very intimate on, on your hardware. Then, when you create the flavor, you're gonna be hinting that this flavor can only be used in when, when this uh, condition is true, this is SSD equals true. Now, this allows the, the, the Nova scheduler, the one that is gonna look for an available hypervisor to decide where your instance should be created on. And, and this way, someone who is using your cloud and is seeing, oh, I have the, the, the flavor SSD.large is gonna have uh, 8 gigs of RAM is going to be a disk size of 80 gigs. 
but also it's going to have the guarantee that this disk is going to be created on, a, on an SSD. And, and that, that way you can manage your, your different needs. Now, um, all these you can do it, in this case, it, these are just flags, so you can do the same for GPUs, you can do for any, any hardware aspects that you may care about. Also, if you have different CPU architectures, you care about differentiating about AMD epics or in contrast to Xeon for, for any reason that you may be, it's relevant to your kind of uh, workloads, uh, you can use any of these. Now, the problem with this is that anyone can use this. So anyone who has access to create an instance based on this flavor is going to be taking advantage of, of these features. But there are many cases where you want to segregate a specific set of hypervisors for a specific project because the budget was given to that project, so they, they purchased those, those nodes. And in those cases, you can also create host aggregates, but in this case, you're filtering by project. And, and that will give you the guarantee that every, every instance that this project, in this case we are addressing it by ID, um, there are be instances are gonna be landing on those, that set of hypervisors. That way you are no longer competing with, with the resources for, for, with another project. And, and if your project is uh, something about research, so those, those nodes are, are really beefy, beefy machines, you're gonna be having a better experience. You, your, your instances are gonna be, in the end, running much better. <clears throat> All right, so then you're gonna start optimizing by CPU. So OpenStack, has a, a series of configuration options. Some, some of them are available on the command line over the REST API, while some others are only available at the, at the nova.com file. Now, when you are defining your, your instances, in the beginning we were saying, okay, this, this instance has eight virtual CPUs, and, and that was it, but then, if your workload is more specific and you want to model a specific kind of, kind of machines, you're gonna start saying, okay, this, the, I want a, a VM that is gonna have this number of sockets, each socket is gonna have this number of CPUs, and it, uh, sorry, this number of sockets, this num uh, each socket is gonna have this number of cores, and then each one of those cores is gonna have this, this number of threads. Now, this allows you to, for more hardware-aware programs, um, to run in a specific way. Again, this is very intimate on, on what you are trying to achieve, because then how this maps back to the hardware, to the hypervisor, it's gonna be relevant. Because if you're, if you're putting too many sockets, CPU sockets in the, for virtual CPUs, you may have uh, effectively a, a, redu a reduction in your performance because that doesn't map really well to the hyperbox or actual hardware. <clears throat> so, for instance, here we have a flavor that is going to be defining two sockets. Each socket is going to have four cores, and each core is going to have two threads. Uh, so, if we launch a VM based on this flavor, Effectively, when we're SSHing into it and we run a less CPU, you're going to be seeing that this machine has 16, 16 CPUs, right? And, and if you start looking into how this is laid out in the, in the, in the machine, it's, it's going to have this CPU architect, uh, topology. Now, the, this, is, this is all fine, so we can define many sockets, many cores, many threads as we want, but we are still have the problem that there is no way to guarantee how this will be running in the hypervisor. The, the scheduler is gonna be moving all these different processes around, and you may be having a, still like a bad experience from the performance perspective. So then you're gonna start defining stricter ways to how these different, different virtual CPUs are gonna be allowed to run. So 
when you have the, the CPU policy, you can start saying, okay, uh, the default is shared, right? So the, the CPU's processes can be, uh, can be floating across all the host cores. Now, um, if you have a, a dedicated set, you're gonna have that each virtual CPU thread at, at the hypervisor is gonna be allocated to a specific core in, the, in that hypervisor. So you're gonna have mapping one-to-one. -one. And, and now it's when you are start seeing the benefits of not over committing your CPUs. Now you have that those virtual CPUs are actually running on a specific core, so they are gonna be running as, uh, more smoothly. Um, and the thread policy allows you to decide when those uh, virtual CPUs are allowed to run in a, in a CPU, in, in a physical CPU, that if it has a hyper-threading enabled or not. Because when you have two threads running on the same core, there are still some, some memory shared there. And depending on what you're trying to do, that may not be um, a good idea. It, could, it can have uh, privacy concerns for the workload or performance concerns. Now, then you have, you have NUMA, and, and you can also model this in the, at the flavor level. level. Now, NUMA is what uh, allows, um, it's a way where the memory is not really accessed equally depending on where your task in the kernel is, ru is really running. The way, the way it looks is this way. So you have that the, really the, the, the memory RAM is associated to a given socket. And so if your program is running here in this socket, oops, you don't see my course, okay. So if, it, if it's running in this core, for instance, and it's trying to access memory pages that are located in this section, the, the timing, the latency is gonna be larger. So again, depending on, the, on your workload and how it's manipulating all this, it's gonna be relevant. So, um, OpenStack is gonna allow you to define how many, no, how many NUMA nodes your virtual, main, your virtual machines wants you have. By default, it's only one and it's gonna be floating around, but you're gonna start making more specific things, like, so I want, uh, I want two NUMA nodes, and each NUMA node is, is, gonna, is gonna be composed of, of this number of CPUs, and then each CPU, uh, a given CPU is gonna have access to a portion of the memory. So then we can create things like, uh, let me find my cursor. Here it is. So you can create asymmetric definitions. So um, in this case, we're defining two NUMA nodes, and then we are saying that for the for the CPU zero, we're gonna for the for the node zero of the of the NUMA we're gonna be assigning zero and one CPUs, and we're gonna be assigning two gigs of memory. Then in the other, in the other NUMA, NUMA node, we're gonna be assigning one, uh, two, three, four, and five, and we're gonna be assigning four gigs of memory. That way, a program that is aware of all these characteristics is gonna be able to manage that memory and, and take advantage of this setup. And this is gonna be tra being translated by the scheduler and when the VM is defined at the libvirt level, it's gonna be giving you a good representation uh, so the hardware can be taken advantage of. Now, <laughs> this, is, this is all great. We're, we're, all, we're trying to map these definitions that are abstract, uh, abstract in the flavor and how all those map into libvirt. But we still have the problem where the kernel at the hypervisor level is gonna be trying to assign a bunch of, of other administrative tasks and in, in, in course that we may want to be really using for virtualization. And in those cases, the recommendation is to start using ISO CPUs. 
So this way you can, in this case, in this example here, SLCPU is a, um, a kernel command line option. You are going to be adding it into, into your graph configuration. So this way, in, in ISL CPU equals 0 31, you are saying from, from the CPU 0 until the 31, don't scale, scale anything there. So the kernel is not going to be considering those uh, to, to assign any, any task. So anything running in the hypervisor, it's going to be only running from the 32 uh, on, and above. And this gives you the guarantees that any VMs using from the 0 and 31 are really running uh, alone there. They are not competing for resources. They are not going to be being, being paused to run other administra administrative things that they, the hypervisor may be trying to do. All right. So that's all what I have for today. Um, anyone has any questions? Thank you. Well, first of all, um, great talk. Really like the uh, content. Um, quite relevant to what I do. Um, but I guess uh, one, you know, one question that I potentially had is like, you know, I guess, you know, here what you showed is that it's like possible to, you know, tune your OpenStack, like your private cloud, um, to get the you know best performance possible. But um, I guess what I'm interested to know is like. How do you maybe like improve the messaging, the documentation? How do you make people like aware of like how to do this performance in like an easy way so that they know that like, oh, this is what I need to do? Because I feel like a common problem is potentially that, you know, folks just like follow a basic tutorial and once it's deployed, it's like, oh, I'm good to go. I don't need to do anything else. And then when they go run their workloads or something, they're like, oh, this is, you know, really slow. This is crap. But that's just because they, you know, potentially didn't know how to configure it. Yeah, that that's true. Uh, the documentation makes a lot of assumptions. Like, for instance, if you go to the Nova documentation on how to configure Numa and how to define flavors, flavors that take advantage of, it's not going to walk you through on why someone may really want to do that. There, there is baked in assumption that someone really knows what it's doing. Um, and then you have that as I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, every time you're taking one of, one of these decisions to push into a given direction to, to take advantage of your hardware, you are putting in a different position when it comes to launching VMs. So the reason why many of these are not defaults, it's because every time you put an extra constraint in the flavor definition, the scheduler is going to have to work harder to find you in a spot in, the, in your fleet of nodes. And, and depending on the number of VMs you may have you, you, and how large your, your set of hypervisor is, you're going to have more times where the scheduler is really not finding a good place to put your VM. It's just failing and give you an error. So how to make that accessible? Um, probably try to at least give you pointers on when, where where to read more about certain things like NUMA, how that affects to the programs that are running there. I think some of those links could be made from the Nova documentation to Libbeard and Kimo, which is the one that probably explains uh, much better and in more depth how all this lays out back in the hypervisor. Hey, thank you. I know what you're saying, because a lot of times when you go there, you just assume default works well. I do. Default works well for me. But I think providing use cases as examples, maybe that will help the users. Because if you have to go rate a lot of men on this and that, there's so many options, right? And we usually try to just try quickly get the work done. I mean, I, you know, I'm working on a user story. I have a time, the you know, this is not something you can spend a lot of time on, but 
I think I like use cases. If you can just list, well, then everybody does something different, right? I'm just saying some of the common uses and give example what would be the the parameters, you know, mm -hmm. you put it in there or whatnot, and I think that will be helpful, but that require work from the developers like you, right? Oh, I had to think about what was <clears throat> most people, but that's what I would recommend, because yeah. there's so many different options, right? How do you even, you worked on for a long time, right? So you know what's the optimum thing to do, but most of us, I don't know about most of us, for <laughs> people like me, a lot of times, I want something quick, right? I may not have the time to get into details, but having seen some use cases, that will help me to determine what should I use, right? So anyway, that's just my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Or you um, can get really details on multiple I, use cases too, right? I, I agree with the sentiment behind that idea. The tricky part is that many times people take those examples as if they were golden rules that they, can, ju they can just copy and paste without really understanding. So I remember a good example here where someone was applying, uh, was dropping the file system cache, uh, and they were running it in a cron job, so they were trashing away the performance of the page caching. And, and they didn't really have a reason. They, they, it was something that they ju just copy and paste from the internet because they said, uh, the internet said that this was uh, to improve the performance, but it, it was under very specific characteristics. And if you don't, you don't understand the characteristic of the thing you're running, it's better to stay in the, in the default values. Mm -hmm. So you're saying we have to dig into it in order to use the powerful thing. So that would mean no default works well for everyone. What? what no it? default works well for I everyone. Know, I know, I know. A lot of those things will make things worse for a lot of people. But they will make things way better for some people. Yeah, right. That's true for everyone. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Just everybody's different. But I think we're always short of time, right? We have to mm -hmm. So real quick, um, I saw you using like an M1 as an example up there. If I were to like compare this to say like, a, like an M1X large or like any sort of AWS instance, have you guys done a comparison of like, okay, this is an M1, this is an M2, or sorry, this is like an M4, 1X large, M4, 2X large, whatever, AWS or your favorite cloud provider instance types, and then said, okay, this is what they're doing, this is what we're doing, like get a comparison of performance or anything like that so I can start to understand like the, like the scheduling algorithms you're using or the, just the assignment algorithms, the, like how, how things are happening under the hood and as a cross comparison to other hypervisors and other ways of doing isolation. Um, specifically, we haven't ever done that because Every, every cloud is choosing, every private cloud based on OpenStack is choosing different set of hardware because the hardware has been changing over time. Many times they, they buy a set of nodes uh, in one point in time and then one year later they're getting a different set of hardware because they want to expand. So, so it's really difficult to say if you apply this set of settings, you're gonna be an equivalent experience to AWS uh, Flavor X. Um, because in the end, all this depends on the hardware you're running more than which setup you have. But fair, and I guess the other question I have is, when EC2 first started, it was a really big problem with noisy neighbors, mm -hmm. like on the same instance. Do you guys, how did, how did you tackle the problem of noisy neighbors in, in what you're doing here? This way, this so, way. So Bas basically, you, start, you, you need to start isolating CPUs, you need to start, uh, stop over committing the CPU in many times, because that's what hurt you the most. Even if you are not really tuning all these aspects, if you say that you're one-to-one -one in terms of virtual CPUs and actual CPU and physical CPUs, 
by default, you're going to get a much better experience. But in reality, many private clouds, they want to overcommit because they don't have the budget and they want to get the idea they have a large capacity. Any other questions? I'm sorry. What does a noisy neighbor mean in this case? Do you see a decoration in performance or what? In terms of, you're talking about AWS, right? I, I just don't understand that. Right. Where everything is on prem for my organization, so I don't know what that means. Noisy neighbors. I see. I get it now. All right. Okay, thanks. Sorry, that was just a... No, that was a good clarification because we all have questions like that. Uh, any other questions here? Thank you very much for that. Thank you.